Hello and welcome to part two of this Harry Potter film series I'm doing. I'm breaking down all the Harry Potter films, pointing out every little detail I noticed, and I'm using my vast Harry Potter knowledge to point out every single hidden detail, easter egg, and anything else I might notice. This could be things from the book, things they revealed after the book's wrapped up, and even things about the production of the film. If you haven't seen part one, I will link it down below in the description, and I'll probably make a playlist with all of these videos once I make more of them. But enough talking, let's get down to it and break this film down. The first shot of the film really shows the town of Little Whinging where the Dursleys live, and it shows how every single house is exactly the same. We saw a bit of this in the last movie, but this shot takes it to a whole new level. Also, the Dursley street and house in the first film was a real place, but when they went back to do this movie, the owners of the house got a little greedy, asking for way too much money. So Warner Brothers said, screw it, we'll make our own house and street, and they ended up using that set for the rest of the movies. Imagine how much money those homeowners could have made if they weren't so greedy. What a missed opportunity. Harry is looking at the book Hagrid made him, and if you look really closely, this might be a picture of James, Lily, and Sirius at James and Lily's wedding, as you can see what looks like a wedding dress here. We see the same page from the last film, and we also see a page with the trio, which is clearly taken during the filming of this movie and not the first one, which technically is not possible because he hasn't seen them at this age yet. But hey, that's movie making for you, especially when your stars are so young and growing so fast. The bedroom Harry is in used to be Dudley's second bedroom where he kept all of his toys and computer games, which Harry actually moved into in the first book, but this is the first time we see him there in the films. Also, it's wild that the Dursleys always had this extra room, but still made Harry sleep in the cupboard under the stairs. That's just wild. Just like in the last movie, you can see tons of pictures of Dudley, but none of Harry, which goes along with the book's description of this house. You would never know that Harry lived there. You'll also notice that there's a phone that still has a cord and an old-fashioned dial, which is interesting because in the last film, we established that the movies took place in the early 2000s and not the 1990s like in the books. But this phone would even be old for the 90s as well, so I'm not sure why they have such an outdated phone. But later in the front hall, we again see an older phone with a wire, but this one isn't as old as the other one because it has actual buttons on it. So maybe the Dursleys collect old phones, I don't know. It looks like they added a few more pictures on the window ledge to go along with the bonsai tree and ceramic boots. They also changed the decorations on the fireplace mantle, again adding more pictures of Dudley and their family, and of course leaving Harry out. They also moved the armchair, flipping it so that it faces the TV rather than having its back to the TV. With any luck, this could well be the day I make the biggest deal of my career. The career that Vernon is referring to is his salesman job at a company called Grunnings, where they make and sell drills, and he had been working there for at least 16 years. Harry's closet has a Gryffindor sticker on it with a lion. And something interesting, this is not the normal Gryffindor logo that we normally see. This has a very different, more simple design. You can also see his Gryffindor Quidditch uniform hung up and two button-down shirts, which look way bigger than his Quidditch robes, and this is because they're hand-me-downs from Dudley, the only kind of clothes the Dursleys provide for Harry. Harry also wears this shirt later on in the movie when he snuck down to Hagrid's. In his room, he also has a Gryffindor flag over his bed, and this one has the real logo from the films on it. You can also see a Hogwarts flag, and what looks like his wand on the shelf above it. Next to that are the knights that Harry played with in his cupboard in the last movie, and that he later found in the cupboard under the stairs in Deathly Hallows Part 1. You can also see his Gryffindor tie, and on his trunk, his Gryffindor scarf, accompanied by his Quidditch gloves. On his desk, you can see a deck of cards, which might be cards for the magical game Exploding Snap. All of his school books are in or on top of his closet, and these are all interesting details because in the book, all of the items I just listed were not in Harry's room, but rather they were locked in the cupboard under the stairs by the Dursleys. You can see what looks like some of Harry's wizarding homework, most likely for potions, as you can see different bottles, ingredients, and cauldrons drawn throughout, showing you what to get, when to pour it in, and even when to stir, as you can see the little handle sticking out of the cauldron here, which I assume means mix it up. Then there's another piece of homework, this one being an essay, which could possibly be for Transfiguration or History of Magic. There's also a little cutout snitch and what looks like a paper depiction of Hedwig. At least I think that's what these are. Clearly Harry isn't the best when it comes to artistic stuff. But then again, the owl drawing on his other closet door might say otherwise. Going back to the Dursley's living room, the picture of Dudley on the side table was changed from a younger Dudley in a circular frame to an older Dudley in a rectangular frame. Seeing Dobby pick up a dirty old sock of Harry's is a great way of foreshadowing what will occur at the end of the film as Harry uses a dirty old sock to free the house self. And there, he was a lot less revolted by the sock. 
The many letters that Dobby had intercepted were from Ron, Hermione, and Hagrid, because in the book, Harry recognized Hermione's neat handwriting, Ron's untidy scroll, and Hagrid's scribble on the envelopes. You can see a calendar slash to-do list in the Dursley's kitchen, which says that the first day of school is on September 1st, which is definitely about Dudley's private school smeltings, because they would not write down Harry's first day at Hogwarts. Then, 14 days into school, they have a parents meeting at smeltings to get to know Dudley's new teachers, and it looks like someone has a dentist appointment on September 19th. The elf magic that Dobby is using here is a different kind of magic than wizards that only they have access to, and it's very powerful. Wizards kept them at bay by not allowing them to use wands though, which if the elves had, they might be even more powerful than wizards. Dobby using magic at the Dursleys got Harry in trouble for using magic outside of school in the book, and this is the first time we learn that they don't actually track each wizard, but rather the areas and households they live in. So in a home like the Weasleys or the Malfoys, the kids could get away with using magic, but it's the parents parents job to make sure they don't because the ministry can't tell who cast the spell, only where the spell was cast. In this picture of Dudley as a younger boy, you can see that he had blonde hair, which in the book he had when he was older as well because Dudley was blonde in the book. Vernon uses a drill to lock Harry's bedroom up, which is probably a drill from his company Grunnings. You can see a book on Harry's bedside table called Witch Owl, and this was a book made solely for the film. However, looking at the author of the book, we see it was written by Miranda Goshawk, who wrote Standard Book of Spells, one of the most used textbooks in the Wizarding World, and are books that got her her own chocolate frog card, which I actually mentioned in the last video. The empty bowl on the desk is a good easter egg, because that night in the book, Petunia had given Harry canned soup through a cat flap they put on his bedroom door. The flying car was a Ford Angula 105E from the year 1959, and the inspiration for this car was that Sean Harris, Rowling's best friend in high school, had this car while they were growing up. The car in the book was magically modified by Arthur Weasley, which went against his literal job of stopping people from adding magic to muggle items. Technically though, it wasn't illegal, because Arthur had purposely written this law with a loophole. As long as you didn't intend on using the magically enhanced muggle object, you're allowed to add magic to it. The license plate on the back of the car in the film says 7990TD, but on official Pottermore art approved by Rowling, it says COS207, which my guess is it stands for Chamber of Secrets 2 out of 7, because it's the second book out of 7 novels. But it is interesting to see the two different versions of this license plate. In Petunia and Vernon's room, you can see even more pictures of Dudley, which is honestly hilarious. These pictures are everywhere, and it's so fitting to the book because the Dursley parents really are so obsessed with their awful son. Though every house is the same, it appears as though the Dursleys added an addition to their house, and as did the house two doors down. In the Dursleys edition, this is where Aunt Marge would come out when she was blown up in the next film. If you look at the surrounding area of the Weasley's house, otherwise known as the Burrow, it's located in the outskirts of Ottery St. Catchpole, and three other Wizarding families live there as well. The Diggories, the Lovegoods, and the Fawcett's, who we don't know as much about, but we certainly know the first two families very well. The pigs outside the Weasley's house is a nice little easter egg, because the burrow was described to be what looked like a pig pen that had a ton of additions added on top of it as the family grew. And just for the record, that was all the filmmakers, because there was never any mention of pigs at the burrow throughout the entire series. The detail of the pan cleaning itself was taken right from the page, I love that they did that. The Weasley clock has two redheaded boys on it, and I don't think this is Fred and George because I'm pretty sure they had this clock before they were born. Instead, I think this might be Molly's twin brothers Fabian and Gideon Pruitt, both of whom died in the first Wizarding War. It's possible that their mother made this clock and put her twin boys on it. Also, the fact that the clock says dentist is interesting, because as we saw in the Half-Blood Prince, wizards aren't really familiar with dentists. My parents are dentists. They attend to people's teeth. Fascinating. And is that considered a dangerous profession? However, Mr. Weasley could have added the dentist line because of his fascination with muggles, but obviously none of them would ever be there, so it was sort of pointless to add it. Also, if you notice, the clock is a grandfather clock, which Rowling said it was in the Goblet of Fire. But later in the Half-Blood Prince, Rowling said that Molly had taken to carrying the clock around, which you could not do with a grandfather clock. And Rowling also said it had hung on the wall, which again, a grandfather clock wouldn't do. So that might have been a mistake by Rowling. But either way, the filmmakers took what the Goblet of Fire said about it being a grandfather clock. This clock back here is probably the second Weasley clock mentioned in the book. This one is a bit different because it tells you what it's time to do rather than telling you the actual time. Things like time to make tea, time to feed the chickens, and so on. 
You can see a drawing that depicted everyone in the family. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, Fred, George, Ron, Ginny, Percy, Bill, and Charlie. Seeing the magic self-knitting, this is probably what Mrs. Weasley does every year for Christmas when she knits a sweater for all of her children and also for Harry. Behind Mrs. Weasley, you can see what looks like potion ingredients as you need worms, frog legs, and a few other bizarre things. There's a lot of art hung up in the burrow, most of which was probably done by Ginny, who was forced to stay home while all of her brothers had been going to Hogwarts for years. But Harry's never traveled by flu powder before, Mom. Flu powder? The flu network was around in the Wizarding World for hundreds of years before this, and it was regulated by the Ministry of Magic, more specifically by the Department of Magical Transportation. Harry enters Borgen and Burks, which is actually a very important location in the series. For one, Voldemort worked there after he finished up at Hogwarts, and that job was how he got both Slytherin's Locket and Hufflepuff's Cup both of which he turned into Horcruxes. Also, Voldemort's mother, Merope, had sold that very locket to the store just before Voldemort was born. The jar of skulls in the shop looks to be house elf skulls. The hand on the cushion that grabbed Harry was the thing that Draco told his father he wanted in the book, and there we found out it was called the Hand of Glory. If you put a candle in it, it gives light to only the holder, which makes it the best friend of thieves. The cabinet you see right here is actually a vanishing cabinet, and in the book, and also in a deleted scene, Harry hid in this. This cabinet also plays a huge role in the Half-Blood Prince, as it's the other half to the one that Draco tries to fix at Hogwarts, and is the very cabinet that the Death Eaters along with Greyback used to enter the school in the sixth installment. Down that alley, you can see all sorts of dark arts shops selling dangerous creatures, poisons, and things that could assist witches and wizards in the dark arts. It's crazy that they made this whole alleyway and never even went down it in the film. Now, I already did a deep dive of Diagon Alley in my last video, so this time I'm just going to point out the big things. Right here is a bookstore called Tricks and Foles, a secondhand bookshop, and next to that is Florian Fortescue's Ice Cream. Across the street is Madame Malkin's robe shop, where most Hogwarts students got their robes. In this shot, you can see the sign as well as the golden snitch statue that connects to quality Quidditch supplies. And across the street from there is Elop's Owl Emporium, where Hagrid got Hedwig for Harry. Next to Elop's is a shop called Wiseacre's Wizarding Equipment, which was made just for the films, but that Rowling later made canon on Pottermore. If you look in the window of quality Quidditch supplies, they've changed the display. They used to be robes for teams from the British and Irish Quidditch League, but it's now Gryffindor and Slytherin Quidditch robes. Hermione using a spell to fix Harry's glasses. Oculus for Paris. Is a callback to their first meeting when she used the same spell. Oculus for we then enter Flourish and Blotts, the most popular bookstore in Diagon Alley that was founded in 1654. We've seen this shop several times throughout the novels, and if you look here, you can see a display for Gilderoy Lockhart's books. The main feature is Magical Me, the autobiography Lockhart wrote about himself. You can also see another one of his books, Travels with Trolls, and back here you can see Gilderoy Lockhart's Guide to Household Pests, which Mrs. Weasley referred to before leaving for Diagon Alley in the book. There's also a book about how to tame tigers, and below that is a book about flying carpets, a means of transportation in the wizarding world used mostly by Asian countries. There are different signs for what books they have. They have sections about the dark arts, house elves, celestial studies, one about wands, invisibility, unicorns, and so on. Also, the hands that point to each section is exactly how Rowling described them. The three books you see in Lockhart's collected works that he gave to Harry is his Travel Trilogy, which includes Holiday with Hags, Voyages with Vampires, and Wandering with Werewolves. You can see an open book on display, and on one side of the page it says F, and on the other it says B, which could stand for Fantastic Beasts, a textbook that Hogwarts students studied, which was written by none other than Newt Scamander, the face of the Fantastic Beast series. When Draco says, Oh look, Potter, you got yourself a girlfriend. He was actually spot on, as Harry and Ginny do end up together. The cane that Lucius uses in this scene is interesting because it never appeared in the books, but was pretty prominent in the films. In the movies, the snake head is the tip of his wand, which he keeps inside of his walking stick. In the Order of the Phoenix film, he actually uses it in battle alongside his wand, which has made many fans believe that it has magical powers, possibly being able to form a shield charm. The second-hand book Lucius mentions Tatty, second-hand book is from Tricks and Foles, the second-hand bookshop I pointed out earlier. 
Lucius picks up one book and puts two back in, one of which is Tom Riddle's diary. This diary is interesting because it was one of Voldemort's Horcruxes, but one that Voldemort made as more of a weapon rather than a lifesaver. He planned to use this weapon to open the Chamber of Secrets again years after he did, and he had trusted Lucius to hold on to it. After he supposedly died, Lucius still had it, and he knew it would reopen the chamber, but did not know why or how, so he decided to have some fun and send it to school with the daughter of the family he hated most. I'll see you at work. Lucius saying that he would see Arthur at work proves to me that the movies and books are two different Harry Potter universes, which I mentioned a few times in my last video, because in the books, Lucius does not work. He has so much money that he doesn't have to, and he only volunteers to be on the Hogwarts board, which is a job where he would not see Arthur Weasley, who worked for the Ministry. The Weasleys parked in a no-parking zone that was meant for taxis, which is pretty funny and shows how they don't entirely understand the Muggle world. You can also see Muggles walking by and rolling their eyes at this, which I think is hilarious and a great little detail. You can see that Percy has his own owl, and this is Hermes, who we had gotten the year before as a present for becoming a prefect, and this is also something I mentioned in the last video. If you pause here, you can see that this is not Daniel Radcliffe, but a stunt double who isn't even wearing the Harry Potter glasses. Oi! What do you do think you're doing? The guy that tells them off is played by Harry Taylor, and is the same guy who played the worker in the first movie. He was also supposed to make an appearance in the epilogue in Deathly Hallows Part 2, but he was caught from the final film. The location of the scene and the bridge is actually the Glenfinnan Viaduct, a popular place for fans to go and visit. You can see kids in the window of the Hogwarts Express watching Harry hanging out of the flying car, which again is just such great attention to detail. The lake that they fly over and the path they take is the same route that the first years take in the rowboats. They of course crash into the Whomping Willow, which has an interesting history on the Hogwarts grounds. It was planted to guard the entrance of the secret tunnel that led to the Shrieking Shack, which was the place where Remus Lupin went to transform into his werewolf form when he was a student at Hogwarts. When the Ford Angula shoots out the luggage from its trunk, the filmmakers added a farting noise which I never noticed until now. The car taking off on its own gives me the opportunity to talk about what happened to the car after they filmed. Three years after this movie, the car was actually stolen from the Southwest Studios in Cornwall, presumably by a fan. Then one year later, the car was found near a castle in England, and nobody ever knew who stole it or how it got there. Or did somebody steal it? Maybe the car really was magic and took itself there on its own. No thief was ever caught, so it might add up. You were seen by no less than seven muggles. The flying car was seen by seven muggles, which is a number that constantly pops up throughout the series, and which I actually made a video on going over every time we hear the number seven in the series, and I'll link that below. You get a really good shot of the Black Lake here, which is home to the giant squid, merpeople, grindalos, and much more. You can also see the many greenhouses, which in the books there are seven of, again that number seven popping up. But in the film, there were actually nine greenhouses. The greenhouse that contains the mandrakes was greenhouse three in the novel, so I assume that this greenhouse that we zoom into is also greenhouse number three. Mandrakes are based on a real-life plant that has been used since ancient times, and long ago could be associated with magical activity and witchcraft, Hence why Rowling added it to her Wizarding World. Nearly Headless Nick says hello to Percy Weasley and a girl named Clearwater. Hello, Percy. Miss Clearwater. This is another great easter egg, as the Clearwater girl is Penelope Clearwater, Percy's secret girlfriend during this part of the book. The two dated from the beginning of the second book to the end of the third book when they finished up at Hogwarts and went their separate ways. I also love how Nearly Headless Nick tips his head like it's a hat. The tape Ron uses to fix his wand is actually Spellotape, tape, which wizards use to fix objects that either couldn't be fixed with a spell or when magic was not deemed appropriate to the situation. Lockhart's classroom is just as described in the book, with pictures of himself everywhere. There's one of him playing Quidditch holding the snitch in the air, one of him flying on a broomstick, another one of him flying on a broomstick, one of him singing, a portrait of himself painting a portrait of himself, who then proceeds to check his real self out, then his real self wings back at his portrait self. <laughs> this is just absolutely hilarious. The filmmakers nailed this. I love it. Lockhart mentions that he won Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award. Of Witch Weekly's Most 
charming smile award. Witch Weekly, no doubt inspired by Woman's Weekly in real life, is a wizarding magazine for witches and was created by a wizard named Tobias Misselthorpe, who is very rich because of it. The magazine basically gives celebrity news in the wizarding world, and Harry himself has been in it courtesy of Rita Skeeter. The dragon skeleton that's in every Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom makes an appearance here, and is actually knocked down by the Pixies. The girl sitting next to Hermione is Susan Bones, and she's played by Eleanor Columbus, the daughter of Chris Columbus, the director of the first two Harry Potter films. On Harry's desk, you can see that trilogy of Lockhart books that Gilderoy gave to him in Flourish and Blots. Cornish Pixies. Freshly caught Cornish Pixies. Pixies are interesting creatures in the Wizarding World because they're freaking menaces. Going deep into Harry Potter lore, there was a woman who was abducted by them in the 17th century. She had terrible PTSD because of it, and she fought very hard for the Ministry of Magic to eradicate the species, but the Ministry of course said no. The look of the pixies in this film is also interesting because Chris Columbus made their look be similar to Gremlins from the 1984 film, which he himself had written. This was his homage to one of his favorite projects in his long career. You can see the pixies throwing Lockhart's book Magical Me, and underneath that is another one of his books, Travels with Trolls. We see the pixies use Lockhart's wand to knock the dragon skeleton down, meaning they can perform magic as well just like wizards, but I don't know if that's true for the book universe of Harry Potter. It's also hilarious to see the pixies riding the dragon as it falls saying yee-haw. <laughs> Neville asking why it's always him Why is it always me? is a running theme throughout the films that's constantly brought up. Is it always going to be you? And this is something that the filmmakers came up with that wasn't in the books. If you look at this shot of the Black Lake, you can see the island in the middle of it, which is where Dumbledore's tomb would be after his death. And right off of that is also where Newt Scamander and Lita Lestrange had a nice moment during their time at Hogwarts. This poster in the hallway is The Rules Made by Filch, and you can see it's a great deal bigger than it was in the last movie. The three girls on the Gryffindor Quidditch team are Angelina Johnson, who would later become captain after Wood left, Alicia Spinett, and Katie Bell, all of whom were chasers. The term mudblood mud refers to the muggle blood in muggleborns, which is dirty blood to pureblood wizards who believe witches and wizards should stay pure. The slugs that Rupert Grint threw up for this scene were candy that Rupert said he actually really liked the taste of. Hagrid's cabin is full of cages, which is a great detail from the set designers, because I'm sure that each one of those used to carry one of Hagrid's wild monsters and creatures he's so in love with. And on the table appears to be his famous rock cake, something the trio always avoided eating if they could, because it could literally break their teeth. Normal rock cakes are a little bit hard, but Hagrid's were literally a rock. In this picture of Lockhart, you can see he's wearing Ravenclaw robes, which is of course the house he's in. They also use the movie's version of the logo, using a raven as the mascot rather than an eagle like in the book. This isn't really an easter egg, but I absolutely love the look Dumbledore gives Lockhart when he says he could have saved Mrs. Norris. I know exactly the counter curse that could have spared her. <laughs> Behind the teachers, you can see an entrance to a girl's bathroom. This is of course Moaning Myrtle's bathroom and where the Chamber of Secrets is located, and this is the only shot we get of it outside of the bathroom. Most of the portraits along the moving staircases depict crew members and their families, allowing them to be immortalized in the films they work so hard on. On the chalkboard in McGonagall's class, the writing is all backwards, and when flipped, it says Transfiguration Lesson 7, again showing that number 7 theme throughout the series. It also shows the incantation it takes to turn animals into cups. They have all sorts of animals in this classroom, including a few birds, a monkey, a lemur, and a few others. This Hufflepuff girl right here is Hannah Abbott, and she's super important after the series because she would go on to marry Neville Longbottom. Next to her is Ernie McMillan, who in the book gave Harry a very hard time as he believed he was the heir of Slytherin. McGonagall goes over the four founders of Hogwarts and tells their story, and I already covered most of their story in the video before this one, but McGonagall did leave out the fact that there was a huge duel between Gryffindor and Slytherin, which was very emotional because they had been best friends for years. This Slytherin girl behind Ron is Millicent Bolstrode, the girl whose hair Hermione thought she put in her Polyjuice potion, and who in the book was matched up with Hermione during the dueling club scene where she put Hermione in a headlock. The book the trio uses to make the Polyjuice potion is a book by Phineas Bourne, and in the novel was in the restricted section, as this was not something that the teachers wanted kids to have. But for some reason that wasn't the case in the movie, it was just there for the taking. Polyjuice potion is something we see used loads of times throughout the Wizarding World, like during the Battle of Seven Potters, when Harry and Hermione went to Godric's Hollow in the book, and even when Newt and Tina broke into the French Ministry of Magic. 
Just like in the last film, you can see Lee Jordan next to McGonagall while announcing the match, which is absolutely perfect because she always monitors and corrects him in the novels. Lee Jordan is also best friends with Fred and George, which we don't see much of in the movies. Blimey. Harry's got himself a rogue bludger. The mention of a rogue bludger is a nice Easter egg, as that refers to the name of this chapter in the book, The Rogue Bludger. The witch in the hospital wing is Madame Pomfrey, a character who had a much bigger role in the books and whose name is not said here, but it is said later on in the movie. Let us have a round of applause for Professor Sprout, Madame Pomfrey. The thing that Harry has to take to regrow his bones is called Skelly Grow, which has a very interesting connection to Harry himself. It was created by a man named Linfred of Stinchcombe, whose nickname was the Potterer, which over time was shortened to Potter, leading to the Potter family, meaning he was an ancestor of Harry's, so the skelly girl that Harry is drinking was made by his own ancestor. The Potterer also connected the Potter family to the Peveril family, otherwise known as the Three Brothers in the Tale of the Deathly Hallows, and he was why the Invisibility Cloak, one of these Deathly Hallows, was passed down in the Potter family for generations, eventually falling into Harry's possession. We see Dobby apparate in the Hogwarts grounds, which witches and wizards could not do due to spells and protections put on the castle. But as I said, elf magic is different than wizard magic, which allows house elves to be able to do things wizards could not. The actress that played Moaning Myrtle was actually born in 1965, meaning she was a 38-year-old playing a 16-year-old girl. Myrtle going down in the toilet is a cool detail because as we found out in the Goblet of Fire, she oftentimes enters the Black Lake by going down the toilet through the pipes. The dueling club table depicts different phases of the moon, which is a detail that I can't explain, but it does look pretty cool. Right here, you can see the hourglasses that count each house's points, each one depicting the house colors. The spell that Snape uses Expelliarmus. is the disarming charm. The spell Draco uses is a knockback charm. Then the spell Harry uses is actually the tickling charm, which is not the result we saw in the movie. Then the next spell that Draco uses Seven sort here. is the snake summon spell. Then the spell that Lockhart uses is the charm to launch something in the air and is the same spell that Mad-Eye, who was actually Barty Crouch Jr., used on Malfoy after turning him into a ferret. And finally, the spell that Snape used Ipera. Ivanaska was the snake vanishing spell, which Dumbledore actually used during his duel with Voldemort, and is a spell that McGonagall used while fighting Snape in the book. If you pause right here, you can see one of the crew members with a camera in the crowd with the kids, which is a pretty big mess up. What Harry actually said here in Parseltongue was, leave him alone. The trio questioning if Harry was related to Salazar Slytherin. But I'm not. He lived a thousand years ago. For all we know, he could be. Is a cool detail because it was actually spot on. He is related to Slytherin. We know this because both he and Voldemort are related to the Peveril family, as both of them got one of the Deathly Hallows passed down in their family, whether it was the Invisibility Cloak or the Resurrection Stone. And because Voldemort is related to Slytherin, that means Harry is too. This scene in the library shows an older woman watching over all of the students. This is the Hogwarts librarian, Madame Pince. The password for Dumbledore's office Sherbet Lemon is always a kind of candy or sweet throughout the novels, as Dumbledore has somewhat of a sweet tooth. All of the portraits shown in the headmaster's office are former headmasters of the school, and after each one dies, the portrait is hung up to help give advice to the current headmaster. Fox and Harry already had a connection before they met here, which Harry isn't aware of until two books later. But that connection is that one of Fox's feathers was the core of Harry's wand, which of course becomes very important later on, as this was Voldemort's wand core as well. Also, a funny fact, Richard Harris, the man that played Dumbledore, thought that Fox the Phoenix was a real bird, when really it was an animatronic. Richard Harris comes over to us and he says, it's absolutely amazing how they train these things, isn't it? Chris and I stood there for a minute and thought, ah, I said, um, no, no it, it's a puppet. And he, he went, bleep off. He believed that Fox was real. When Hagrid comes into Dumbledore's office, he's holding a dead rooster, which ties back to a plot point in the book where all of the roosters had been killed. We later find out that this was done by Ginny while possessed by Voldemort, as he wanted to get rid of the one thing that was a threat to the basilisk, which is a rooster. Don't ask me why, but that's just ancient folklore. The sleeping draft that Hermione mentions, I filled these with a simple sleeping draft. 
is actually the same thing used for Drought of the Living Dead, which kills the person consuming it. However, you make the sleeping version of it much less powerful, meaning it only puts them to sleep for a few hours. There's a very small margin of error for this, because if you mess up just a little bit, you'll kill the person you're using it on. Harry? Run. The fact that they still have their own voices with Pology's Potion is interesting, because this wasn't the case in the books. And that's all well and good, but it sort of messes up Barty Jr. impersonating Mad-Eye, because unlike Harry and Ron, he has Mad-Eye's voice, not his own. So it's sort of inconsistent, but what are you gonna do? Draco's line of... Reading. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you could read. ...was hilariously improvised by Tom Felton. The Slytherin common room was in the dungeons behind a bare stretch of wall, and I have to say, the set designers did a great job making the common room. It really does feel like it was made for Slytherins with the black leather couches and the coloring of the room. Harry going into the memory in Tom Riddle's diary is the same magic used for going into memories with the pensive. You can see a badge on Tom Riddle's robes, which is a prefix badge, as he was in his fifth year at Hogwarts and had a lot of respect from many professors. He would later go on to become head boy in his seventh year as well. Dumbledore mentions Headmaster Dippet. Headmaster Dippet may have no choice. This refers to Armando Dippet, the headmaster of Hogwarts before Dumbledore, while Dumbledore was merely the Transfiguration Professor, and as we found out in the Fantastic Beasts series, also the Defense Against the Dark Arts Professor. Dumbledore's interaction with Tom Riddle is exactly the same as his interaction with Harry earlier in the film. Is there something you wish to tell me? Is there something you wish to tell me? No, sir. Nothing. No, sir. Nothing. On the chalkboard is Wood's many plays and plans for their Quidditch team, and this was one of his famous hour-long speeches that often put the rest of the Gryffindor Quidditch team to sleep. In the background, you can see the Hufflepuff players flying on the pitch already, and this is a great detail because that is who they were going to play at this moment in the book. Right here to the left, you can see the Gryffindor notice board in the common room, which as I mentioned in my last video, tells students about upcoming events like Hogsmeade trips, and in this installment is where they learned about the dueling club. They really went with the old-fashioned look for Cornelius Fudge in this movie, which differs greatly from the next few depictions of him. Take me where, not Azkaban prison. The mention of Azkaban prison is of course the wizard prison on an island in the middle of the North Sea guarded by Dementors. Fudge trying to stop Lucius from firing Dumbledore is a great little moment as he steps forward, but then backs down. This adds up perfectly because Fudge is super reliant on Dumbledore, writing to him almost every morning for advice. He certainly wouldn't want Dumbledore to be fired. At least not yet. That will definitely change later on. Something that the movie never came forth and said is that Aragog is blind. We do not speak of it. The spiders not speaking of the basilisk is a great parallel to wizards not speaking of you know who. This is even more poetic because those two things, Voldemort and the basilisk, team up. When the car went back in the Forbidden Forest, it spent the rest of its life there, and Rowling said that she had meant to bring it back later in the series, but just never did. Personally, I think it would have been pretty cool to see it during the Battle of Hogwarts. When the boys go into Lockhart's classroom, you can see that all of the pictures that used to be there are gone and packed away, and as is the giant portrait of himself. You can see a wig on Lockhart's desk, meaning his hair might not actually be as perfect as it always appears to be. Myrtle mentions Olive Hornby. I'd hidden because Olive Hornby was teasing me about my glasses. This was her bully at Hogwarts who always made fun of her, and Myrtle got her revenge as she stalked Olive in her ghost form, following her everywhere she went and even disrupting her brother's wedding. Olive went to the Ministry of Magic to get Myrtle to stop, and the Ministry made sure that she did, sending her back to Hogwarts. You can see a snake on the sink faucet, which many people have pointed out would not be there for Slytherin to make because there was no such thing as plumbing when the school was made. But there's actually a really interesting story in Harry Potter lore that actually explains this. The chamber was originally accessed through a concealed trap door in a series of magical tunnels, and when Hogwarts plumbing became more elaborate in the 18th century, the entrance to the chamber was threatened. A student at the time named Corvinus Gaunt, who was a direct descendant of Salazar Slytherin himself, ensured that the trap door was secretly protected meaning those who could access it would still be able to do so even with the plumbing placed on top of it. I assume it was Corvinus Gaunt who put the snake on the faucet. What Harry said in Parseltongue here was open up. 
The chamber itself is miles under the Black Lake, and all the bones on the floor were rat skulls that the basilisk had eaten. We don't see this in the films, but the memory charm that rebounded on Lockhart sent him into a state that made him a danger to himself. Because of this, he was admitted to St. Mungo's Hospital, a wizarding hospital, and he lived the rest of his life there in the memory ward, never getting his memory back. The statue of the man's face is that of Slytherin himself. Breaking down the name Tom Marvolo Riddle, Tom Riddle came from his muggle father, Tom Riddle Sr., and Marvolo came from his grandfather, Marvolo Gaunt, a pureblood obsessed, abusive man. I always wondered why his mother, Merope, named her son after the father that physically and mentally abused her, so much so that it repressed her magic. I feel like she would want to name her son anything but Marvolo. We hear Fox's screeches, which is actually Phoenix Song or Phoenix Lament, and it has powerful magic as it touches the soul in either positive or negative ways. It increases the courage of the pure of heart and strikes fear into the hearts that are impure. When Tom speaks in parcel tongue to open the statue's mouth, he said, Speak to me, Slytherin, the greatest of the Hogwarts Four. And the command he gave the basilisk was kill him. Also, speaking of basilisks, in Harry Potter lore, they were first created by Herpo the Fowl, an ancient Greek wizard who pretty much trademarked the term Dark Wizard, as he created basilisks, was the earliest known parcel mouth, created many dark spells, and most of all, invented the darkest bit of magic, Horcruxes. But Herpo figured out that hatching a chicken egg under a toad created the King of Serpents. We see rats running along the pipes with Harry, who probably saw many of their family and friends dead in the chamber, hence their urgency to get away. The sword of Gryffindor coming out of the sorting hat has an interesting detail. The reason why it's able to do that is because both the hat and the sword belong to Godric Gryffindor himself. The ink shooting out of the diary is actually the blood of the Horcrux, and the light coming out of Voldemort mimics that blood, because whatever happens to the diary happens to Riddle, and once the diary is dead, so is Tom as he explodes. This shot of them being pulled out of the chamber is of course taken from the American book cover. That you both receive special awards for services to the school. Ron and Harry getting special awards to the school is the same award that Tom Riddle got for turning Hagrid in, which we actually saw an easter egg of in the last movie. Godric Gryffindor. The Sword of Gryffindor has an interesting past, as it was made for Gryffindor by goblins, more specifically the king of the goblins named Ragnuk. However, by the time Ragnuk had finished the sword, he liked it so much that he wanted it for himself, but he knew that he had to hand it over to Gryffindor. He later regretted this though, so he sent a group of his goblin subjects to steal the sword back from Godric. However, they were no match for Gryffindor, and he sent the goblins back with a message and a threat for their goblin king. After that, Ragnuk did not dare mess with Gryffindor again, so instead he spread rumors that Godric had stolen the sword from the Goblin King, which actually tarnished Gryffindor's reputation to many witches and wizards, and especially in the eyes of goblins. Some of the best lines in the series are, Let us hope that Mr. Potter will always be around to save the day. Don't worry, I will be. And this was actually all improvised by both Jason Isaacs, who plays Lucius, and Daniel Radcliffe, who plays Harry. <laughs> the spell Lucius was about to use was Avada Kedavra, which is the illegal killing curse. Here we see another example of elf magic, which can actually take down a fully grown and pretty powerful wizard, showing just how strong elf magic is even without wands. In the post credit scene, we cut back to Flourish and Blotts, the bookstore in Diagon Alley, and it pans down to a new Lockhart book called Who Am I? As you can see, he's in a straitjacket, and this picture was most likely taken at St. Mungo's Hospital in the Memory Ward, the place that, as I mentioned earlier, was where he spent the rest of his life. The book Who Am I was not something we heard about in the novels though, this was a book made solely by the filmmakers. Also fun fact, this is the only post credit scene throughout the 8 movies. But there it is, every single easter egg and a full breakdown of the Chamber of Secrets film. Stay tuned for the next video in the series where I dissect and break down The Prisoner of Azkaban.
Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.